Good. So we start then. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so uh, hello, uh, I'm Fabrizio. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this talk. Uh, today, together with my colleague Jens, uh, we will introduce you a little bit on um, how we use AI and in general computer vision uh, for uh, sports broadcasting. So, oops, this thing is not working. Perfect. Of course, it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, before starting the talk, I wanted to give you a little introduction uh, on both of us. So I'm Fabrizio, guy there on the left, on the right, actually my right. Uh, I've been working in computer vision slash machine learning for more or less 15 years or so. I did my studies in London at UCL, then I moved here to Zurich at ETH for a postdoc position. And then in 2017, I started to work for Wizard Team first as a software engineer, now as a senior software engineer. And uh, since a few years, I'm also a little bit in charge for the academic collaboration of our, uh, together with Jens, of our Zurich office. And Jens, uh, my colleague here, he has a very similar career as mine, except he did his studies here at ETH, uh, both masters and PhD, and then again moved to Wizard T, uh, where now he's a senior software engineer. Uh, since 2018. So, uh, as I say, today we will go a little bit through some of the stuff we do uh, in Wizard more specifically in Zurich. Uh, I'll soon I'll introduce you to the company, Wizard which probably you have never heard of because it's kind of a specialized company. Uh, and then we will focus more on sports broadcasting, which is uh, essentially what we developed here in Zurich. Uh, we have two main software in Zurich, with Libero with Arena. We look at both of them. And then in the second part of the talk, Jens will walk you through um, uh, some solution, uh, uh, AI-based solutions, again, for sports broadcasting. Uh, he'll focus on, basically, what's the journey that one should make if he wants to deploy uh, a research idea to production, and then we will also, he will also introduce you to uh, something that goes a little bit behind sports, which is called the talent tracker. So uh, when you see uh, the news or something like that, basically tracking of the anchorman or the pundit uh, for uh, augmented reality uh, TV sets. Okay, so uh, I'll start uh, by introducing you to Wizard T. Uh, as I said, it's likely you have never heard of the company because uh, it's a company that does very specialized software. It's, for, it's the software for it's software for broadcasting. But if you watch TV, uh, there's quite a high probability that you have seen uh, quite a lot of our software of, of the stuff we do. And uh, I'll now play a short video to just show you uh, an overview of the broader things that we do. I hope the Okay, there is audio. This is still okay. <laughs> there will be videos with a little bit more annoying sound. But um, basically, essentially, everything that uh, goes on TV, from the news to sports to the Meteo channel and whatnot, uh, we provide software for that, right? To facilitate essentially this uh, uh, so broadcasting. I'll just let the video play. Right, so um, that's more or less the, you know, the, uh, the things that we do at Wizard T. And uh, uh, Wizard T is a, kind of like a global company. It has several sites around the world, but the R&D is mostly uh, for, um, kind of like, uh, based in Europe. Uh, there are sites in Bergen, Stockholm, Innsbruck, Lisbon, and of course Zurich. And here in Zurich, we uh, mainly develop uh, the two software that have to deal with uh, with sports. Uh, the, co the the office is quite young. 
uh, yeah, that's more or less everyone in the office, and it's mostly focused on uh, R&D. Uh, we have some sales people, but it's mostly R&D. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we quite often do off-sites where obviously we do things related with sports, uh, and we do a lot of sports ourselves in general. Uh, but what's actually kind of nice of the job is that quite often we are also on productions. Uh, so we go either on uh, sports productions, for example, where we go and observe. Either we go operate our software or we go and observe how our software is used such that we can you know, understand um, whether there's something to improve, if it works first, whether there's something to improve, and uh, we also take, take feedbacks from the operators. Or we go like on visits to broadcasters, um, where we just go and check out studio sets and, uh, and uh, in general, operation rooms. And uh, when we can't make it physically, we also try to understand the game a little bit better virtually. No, that's just uh, our office here, just to show you, we, quite often we have some social gathering where we, we do things together, like playing FIFA, for example. Um, okay, so as you've seen also from the video, the sports part of Wizardy is quite big, so it's kind of a, one of the main focus of the company. And uh, actually in Zurich, sorry, the, the offerings that we have uh, re revolves around three main topics. One is um, uh, video, uh, sorry, sports analysis, so events analysis. Um, you can imagine of this as, for instance, replay or um, you know, af after a game has happened, after an action has happened, you would use the software here called Viz Libero to analyze this. And the other part is what Viz Arena does, which is the other software, which is uh, live graphics insertion. Also, uh, so basically during a game, whether you want to show some statistics or do some AR, um, visualization, or if you want to um, insert new graphics in or uh, replace some graphics that already exist. So just to show you visually, uh, that would be the Vizlibero thing. So this is, you know, after an event has happened, for instance, a goal, an offside, or, or whatnot, you can very, very simply and very quickly visualize that and just uh, insert some graphics. Or <clears throat> if you have a live event, for instance, the MotoGP or an Oki game, you can just kind of like uh, draw, uh, render things on top of it and, uh, and somehow uh, explain the, the, the happening better, right? Sorry, sorry, um, can you see it from behind or shall we dim the light? Maybe we can dim the Is it possible to dim the light? Then we... Going down, right? Yeah, the thing, the one. Oh, no, sorry, I took the wrong one. Shit. Okay, perfect. This is much better. Uh, there is still this one, but. Uh, okay. I, I don't know how to switch off this one up here, which is quite probably the only one that matters. <laughs> I think I know, maybe we need to do this. Yeah, perfect, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, good, yeah. So, uh, sorry, where was that before? Ah, yes, okay, so just maybe now you look at it a little bit better. So that's the, after a game is up and after an event is up, you would use this Libero. And conversely, during a game or during an event, you would use this Arena to do augmented reality style uh, um, uh, graphics insertion. Now, Again, uh, we are a media company, so it's much better if I show you a video rather than me standing here and talking. And this is a show reel, it's a one minute video of some of the stuff that you can do with our, with, with our, so, our software focus on sports. Okay, good, uh, the music is low. <laughs> yeah, so you have uh, AR views, for example, or yeah, this is just a virtual set. So basically you would reconstruct something and then uh, show it live in a, in, a, in a studio set like that, for example, or yeah, I'll just play the video, then you can look at it for yourself, but...
Okay, so basically you've got a, a, an idea of what we do uh, in Visor T Sports. And now I would just like to go a little bit you know, uh, more into details into the two software that we have. And we start from VisLibero. So re remember, VisLibero is the software that you would use for, to do video analysis, uh, so event analysis, or uh, uh, so you, essentially what, is what you see here in the, in the, in the, in the picture. And uh, just remember, typically this, this tool is used right after a game or right after an event has happened to analyze, I don't know, an offside or a foul or, or, or whatnot. And <clears throat> to this extent, uh, the, t the things that you would do typically with Libero is, for instance, uh, again, like annotation of a video, uh, whether that's uh, on, on the ground, so kind of like localized, or more in general, kind of um, highlights and, and, uh, and, and, and zoom in and things like that, but just essentially annotation. Uh, you can do AR views. Or uh, you can, again, do annotation and extending the annotation with some information, player tracking, and these kind of things. Or you can do what is called virtual flights. Uh, it's a bit hard to see it from an image. You will see in a second, you will see a video of that, which is essentially when you fly from different cameras and in between you interpolate views such that you can create this kind of like fly effect. And uh, yeah, pretty much anything else that you can imagine as a sort of uh, mixed reality uh, rendering where you essentially have a pundit here, um, so an anchor man here, and then you know he's just analyzing what's what's going on in the game. So um, I've I've put here a, a video that somehow uh, condenses all of the stuff I told you right now. This is a release video, so don't don't worry about the text. Uh, that's not important. Just focus on the graphic, on the graphics that 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 are, that are shown in here. So this the first thing that you see here is what we call the flights, right? Virtual flights, where you have several different cameras, and you then have like transition between cameras, where then you can kind of like uh, see the action from a different viewpoint and perhaps add more uh, information to the action. Yeah, this is another example, uh, which is also kind of cool because you, you see it from a lot of different uh, viewpoints. Uh, this is essentially other things that you can do in Libero, which is like selecting all individual players uh, to then basically key them out and do uh, um, yeah, typically AR graphics rendering. Uh, again, don't worry about the text. This is some release uh, information. Um, yeah, you have live, uh, live uh, data uh, insertion. You've got player tracking to basically move things around and, uh, and explain essentially what happens if or what will happen in a, in, in a few steps. So basically, in general, this tool is, is, is used to analyze, right? To, to basically, after, after signing has happened, you would use this tool to analyze stuff a little bit compelling, such that the viewer can understand, so TV viewers can understand a little bit better of, of, of what's going on. And now I just, I've selected three features I, I, I would like to show you, because these are a little bit the, let's say, the most compelling features are also some of the hardest that we have to, to, to that, that we have had to implement. And we start from this one, which is called Virtual Flights. So Virtual Flights is, it's, uh, so in a nutshell, if you are familiar with uh, computer graphics, is a free viewpoint renderer. A free viewpoint renderer is essentially a, a renderer that is able to interpolate between different viewpoints, so between different cameras. And as you can imagine, if you have a camera here, a camera here, everything in between n needs to be somehow recreated in you know, the moment you want to transition between one view to the other. And this is exactly what this, um, Virtual Flights feature does. I'll play the video because it's a little bit more clear. Uh, and essentially, every time you see this transition from one, from one viewpoint to another, obviously, we don't have such a dense rig of cameras, right? This is all virtually rendered. And you see that the, 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 the effect that you get is kind of nice. It looks like you have, you have frozen the, the, um, the action, and you can somehow uh, fly in, in the action such that you can understand a little bit better things. For example, here, you know, how open that player was on the left to take the shot, yeah, with this thing, uh, or you know, what's, what's essentially the difference between the players. Now, uh, on top of this one, we've built another feature, which is also, so it's not that much different from this one, but it goes one step further in a sense that you've seen the, the flights is essentially a, a steel frame, right? Everything is, is, is kind of like frozen, and then you, you move around. In the virtual runs, as the name says, we actually, again, freeze the, 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 the environment, fly, fly somewhere else, but then we animate um, part, of the, uh, part of the scene 
you know, to kind of like focus on one individual players in this particular example, to essentially, again, explain to the viewers, uh, you know, in this particular case that Cook is behind Jones and he makes the run to get the ball. And uh, yeah, so uh, these this were the first two uh, features that somehow uh, are, you know, are some of the most compelling that we have. But I think I, I've, put, I've put this one because I find this one as really the, the coolest, oh, this microphone, the coolest um, uh, application of Libero, which is what we call Libero AR. So essentially, uh, what I've seen so far is always like, you know, there is, there is a viewer, uh, sorry, there is a pundit, say, sanding, then the camera, you know, a video is shown, and there are all these cool effects. In here, we took a step further in a sense that we kind of fuse the, uh, the, the, the anchorman, the pundit, with a virtual set and with the, with the video, right, to create an augmented reality uh, view. Uh, sort of presentation. And let me play you this video where basically you see obviously this is virtual and the camera is also moving virtually within the stadium. And you see all of this is rendered virtually, right? But then we can zoom in and now the real video kicks in. Uh, soon there will be another freeze frame where, some, yeah, where basically the cameraman can again virtually pan out. Now you have a virtual reconstruction, you can just render whatever you want there. And you see at the top, there is, there is the, 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 the anchor man, you know, the pundit is at the top, basically so, sort of like looking into the, looking into the virtual stadium and, and being able, kind of like mixed reality uh, way of, of, of explaining uh, what, what's going on, right? And then at the end, yeah, it zooms back in and then uh, there'll be the goal uh, with, with the celebration. But yeah. So, um, all, all of the features which I've seen before, uh, seen so far, sorry, they are, ev they are heavily dependent on classic computer vision uh, um, algorithm. And, uh, you know, in there we have uh, things like uh, player cutout, we have camera calibration. There is also a lot, a lot of uh, computer graphics, for instance, the free viewpoint render. You might ask, you know, where is AI actually used, if, if at all, in the end, this, AI was in the title of our talk. Well, uh, it turns out that a very big component of all of these features is to essentially cut, you know, what is called the player cutout, right? So to, to understand, uh, to figure out in each of these videos uh, the silhouette, so the contour of every and each player, uh, such that you can then get out this player, add some graphics in there, and put back the player to then, you know, basically have this mix of, of, of real and virtual graphics, or simply use the texture to basically do the rendering when we do this free view pointing, right, in the flights. Um, uh, the reason I have this slide here is because until uh, not too long ago, we relied on a classic pipeline also for this, so a computer vision pipeline, which worked in most of the cases, but sometimes it could fail massively, right? And recently we have uh, introduced uh, basically a deep learning based uh, approach for this that it's actually very solid. Uh, it works in uh, loads of different light condition and it's particularly interesting when you focus on a very tough sport as is basketball because basketball has all this reflection on the, on the parquet where basically you have kind of like player reflection then it's a bit hard to figure out what's the reflection, what is not. Um, and actually, the, the, the new thing that we have is, the new algorithm that we have is much more stable. So I won't go too much into details here. Jens will uh, touch on this again. But this is just to give you an idea, basically, how, how and where uh, we started to use AI to basically automatize and make things much better and much faster also for the operator because this is just way faster and, you know, to operate like this. You don't have to do any correction. You already have the right thing right there. Um, yes, so uh, this was an overview of the first tool that we have, so Libero. We now move to the second one, which is Arena. And Arena is essentially a tool of choice. Uh, so what you would choose if you had to insert augmented reality graphics into live events. So you're watching a game, you want to show something, some information, some new graphics, some virtual advertisements, as you see them, for instance, at the back there. Well, then you would essentially use Arena. So... Um, Arena, uh, uh, just uh, 
to recap, is used to do things like uh, AR, so uh, lineups and, and player formation, so kind of information uh, while the game is being prepared. You can render anything you want because actually Arena has a pretty solid camera tracking engine in, in, in the back that basically is able to track the entire field from one or more cameras such that you can just do reprojection of graphics from several, dif several different views. Um, it does um, data, uh, sorry, live data insertion. So, for example, this is the down and distance line in uh, in American football. That uh, it, I, I'm I'm not a big fan of American football, but apparently it's quite essential to visualize this thing, to understand or how, how much time you've got before you need to, I guess, make a pass. Um, and uh, the zone chart in basketball is another cool example. So here you see a localized map, uh, so chart that tells you how the opponent, how the offending team in this particular case is scoring, from where and which percentage. And uh, yeah, and then essentially just have some really compelling AR style graphics to, uh, yeah, to make the coverage of the sport much, you know, much, much, much more interesting, let's put it like that, or cooler, or just to do like a virtual advertisement, which you might guess is a huge business in sport advertisement, sports on TV. So, uh, again, I'm going to show you a release video uh, just because it packs a lot of these little features next to each other. Uh, don't, don't worry about the text. You don't have to focus on that. But, yeah, this is, again, this is Arena, right? What Arena can do. And in, in a second, it's, you know, this is just a quick show reel. But, yeah. So, as I said, we've got virtual hats. So, all of these things here are actually fake, right? They're all virtual. They are not in the stadium. Uh, you, you can basically render them whatever you want once you are able to key out, so take out the player or the objects out of your environment, and you can put them anywhere, right? Um, yeah, here's more examples. Uh, yeah, we've got data, live data integration in Arena, so you you know you get uh, information about the current game, yeah, the example I showed you before, and, and essentially you can just uh, render it uh, in an AR fashion, yeah, lines up is also quite uh, quite a big thing. So before a game, you you know you get all this information: who's going to play, where, and and, and things like that. Uh, there's live player tracking, so we get tracks of the players, and you can then render things like how many points these guys have scored so far. Um, you know, some interaction between players. The virtual shot clock is also quite cool. This is uh, how much time you've got before you need to make a shot in the MB in, in basketball, and this is quite good for who the, the guy who's watching the game. The down in distance line, uh, also apparently very important for, for football. Uh, yeah, and just 3D virtual graphics, right? So just to make your coverage much, much more compelling. Uh, let's put it like that. Okay, this video can go on, goes on for, for forever, but that's basically what I wanted to show you. And as I did for Libero, now I want to focus on two or three features which are which are kind of cool. And the, and the first one is this augmented reality graphics. So obviously, once you have your your stadium or your arena, or in this case uh, for the MotoGP, like your circuit tracked, so where, 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 when you know where your camera is and what it's looking at, and when you know like how this you know, what's, what's, a, what's a, mo a motor, right? So what, what's, a, what's an object, a foreground object, you can now do very cool augmented reality graphics. And here's, here's an example. When first we have uh, a simple 3D model, you know, uh, shown up there, you see the helicopter there at the back is kind of cool. I've seen it while putting up this presentation that moves behind the heads of the of, of the race of the drivers, but what 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 will be much cooler is the next one. This is all virtual. The stands covered in the Austrian flag, and in here you have a sort of tunnel made of graphics with all the uh, um, uh, whatever the guys that drive the motor. Sorry, uh, and then they go through it, right? So you, you see it, it's kind of like nicely rendered and uh, embedded in the environment. Um, another example of, of, of what you can do with Arena is this data-driven graphics. So, uh, you know, you're watching a game, you want to explain a little bit better what's going on, and, um, and you basically can do that right on the, on the game as the game is played. So percentage, uh, maybe I'll play the video, it's actually a nicer video. Uh, this, this is from El Clasico of last year. This is an important game in the, in the Spanish La Liga. And you see, before the game, you can basically show them uh, lines up. Uh, and then I think there will be the Real Madrid lines up now, yeah. 
And then right after this, um, yeah, right now, so you'll see there will be like key information. This is, for instance, where the guy was passing the ball with, with, with vintage. So you basically are localizing the information and people at home watching this can, you know, get this information visually and kind of like really directly. Another cool one is, is this one where you can actually show live and historical data at the same time. And, you know, instead of being just shown on the lower third, where you kind of have to lose the focus on the game, they are shown right on the players as they move. For instance, in here, you'll see the speed of Bale as he runs, which is uh, kind of neat because you're still watching the game and you've got your information just right there. Uh, or there is like this interaction map now, so this interaction net network where you see how David Luiz with which percentage is passing the ball to his uh, um, uh, team members or how Pirlo made successful passes uh, from, from which area he's passing to where. Or uh, the delivery analysis, for instance, what is this guy going to do with which, with which percentage uh, when he's kicking from there. So, you know, just basically trying to explain what you're watching a little bit better without losing too much focus on the, on the game, so with a lot of context, context, actually. And then there is historical data, for instance, how much this guy has scored when he, when he, when he shoot a penalty, uh, which is also kind of, kind of neat. And again, more data, uh, this is more kind of explain, you know, the, the rules of the game or uh, some, 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 some interesting aspect of the game again, you know, like how, how much they've scored so far and from where. Um, yeah, as we saw already with Bale, kind of like localized on, on the players themselves. Uh, yeah, and then of course one of the biggest usage of the of the of the software it's essentially virtual hats, which is um, you know you've got a, um, a stream of a of a um, of a game, and you can uh, render virtual advertisement. Uh, basically localized depending on where the stream is going. For instance, you would have the European stream, the Asian stream, the South American stream, always with a different advertisement. And this is what I showed you already at the beginning. So you, you basically can show this advertisement as if they were in the, in the arena. So people are kind of like look, uh, looking at the, at the game and they can, and they also unfortunately look at the advertisement at the same time. And in here, uh, you'll see that some of those are real, some of those are fake, but when you look at the game, you can't, can't really tell which one or which one, but actually all of these are virtual, right? So uh, they, are, uh, they are all added in post. And uh, yeah, again, as we discussed uh, before, uh, our, our, so all, all the stuff that you've seen so far are very computer vision heavily uh, dependent. Almost every feature uh, builds on like computer vision blocks, but uh, one very important aspect of this uh, of these features of Arena is that you know we are we, we need to understand what is a foreground and what is a background. So what's a player? What's the referee? What's a flag? And what's the background? Because when we actually want to render new graphics into into the stream, we we, we need to make sure that we don't cover the, the foreground, right? So we don't want to cover a player, we don't want to cover the referee and whatnot. So this this act, this task is called keying, which sometimes is also referred as segmentation. And uh, un uh, until a few years ago, again, we relied on a very classic pipeline, so a computer vision pipeline, which, was co which is color-based, which is the stuff that you see there in the left. And obviously, this works very nicely when your color is uniform or in the uniform range. Uh, but as soon as you have these sort of uh, 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 situations, like you know, shadows, uh, lighting which is not controlled and whatnot, it fails quite bad. And since a few years, we have developed again an AI-based or a deep learning-based uh, keyer that actually is able to. It, it, it's quite consistent on on a lot of different. Uh, in many situations, including very challenging situations, I'll show it to you again a video just to show you the difference. I think, uh, uh, yeah, on the left you see the color here, so the old one, on the right you see the new one. There, whatever is black at the top is, is, is foreground, so detected as foreground, and at the bottom you see the graphic rendered. You see in there all these artifacts, and you see in here there are absolutely no artifacts. In there, you know, in there the ads even disappear, whilst in here is kind of rock solid. And, and this is even more uh, extreme if you look at very extreme situation like basketball, where, for instance, you have all these cameras very close to the, so video cameras very close to the, uh, to the players, and they all shoot together. So there's a lot of flash which saturates the image. 
And uh, in the old color here, we would just lose the advertisement, right? Because you simply cannot detect this anymore as, as background. Whereas with the new pipeline that we have, this, is, this works, right? It's, it doesn't depend on color. It does to some, to some extent, but not so much as that one. And then we, <clears throat> we get this uh, very nice result. So again, this was just a teaser on what uh, Jens will talk a little bit uh, in a little bit more details. And actually, I think uh, my time's up. Uh, Jens. Good. Thank you, Fabrizio. So yeah, as Fabrizio said, um, you have seen a lot of applications of uh, AI and computer vision in our products. And I want to talk a bit um, about how we actually uh, go from research ideas and solutions um, to, the, to the actual implementation and solution that we use for production. And yeah, there are quite some uh, challenges to overcome. Uh, is that yours? OK. So, as Fabrizio already mentioned, um, common computer vision problems that we have to tackle include uh, keying, matting, object detection and tracking, human pose detection and tracking, uh, camera calibration, and many more. And um, now, since these problems are really common in computer vision, especially in recent years, um, a lot of code and models uh, have been made publicly available on the internet. So you might ask, well, can't you just pick whatever is state of the art currently and, and use it in your product? Um, sometimes the answer is yes, but unfortunately, usually the answer is, is no. It's not that simple. So we do take our inspiration from academia. So whenever we face a new problem, uh, we browse research papers, read through the papers, think which approach might be most suitable to our problem. Then we apply it to our problem. And if the results look kind of promising, we take that as a, as a starting point or as a baseline and then continue working on it. Um, but um, compared to, to the data that's usually used in research, um, we have different or additional challenges. So compared to more general data, what we have in sports footage is often uh, very fast moving objects. We have a lot of motion blur. Um, we have uh, camera distortion, so that's made even worse because as the camera zooms in and zooms out, the uh, distortion parameters and the intrinsics of the camera actually change as a function of the focal length. So you really need to do a, a thorough um, calibration for the whole zoom range of the camera and not just for single images. Um, for example, in sports like uh, American football or rugby, you will have a lot of overlapping players that make it more difficult uh, to detect players or segment players. And as Fabrizio mentioned, for the AI here, we often have quite challenging light and environment conditions. So sometimes if you have a cloudy day, it can be that like half of the stadium is in the bright sun, the other half is in the shadow. And then they try to adjust the exposure of the camera, but um, sometimes you will just have an oversaturated uh, picture or image on one side and a very dark image on the other side, which again makes it much more difficult um, to, to do all these tasks. And finally, um, due to the dynamic nature of the sports, um, you will also have hugely uh, different scales. So you might have zoomed in views of players or uh, views where it's really zoomed all the way out, where the players become really small and pixelated. Um, so that's, that's just the problems introduced by the data itself, but additionally, um, because of the nature of broadcasting, you will face even more problems. So one thing is, um, it's always a question, how do you measure perceptual error? So in the end, we're not really interested in the segmentation that has the lowest pixel error or the, like, the least pixels that are, uh, uh, well, that are keyed uh, wrongly. Uh, but we're actually in the interested in the solution that looks the most pleasing. So one thing that's really disturbing to viewers is if you have flickering pixels. So for example, if you have the segmentation of an arm and you have a part of the arm that's constantly changing from background to foreground, background, foreground, 
then this flickering is really disturbing to the viewer, so it might even be uh, more pleasing if you just kind of always classify the arm as background because then you won't have the flickering, even though, of course, it's, it's a wrong segmentation and would give you a higher uh, error for the segmentation. But it would be temporally consistent, even though it's kind of wrong, but might still look more pleasing to the viewer at home. And as Fabrizio mentioned, we also do uh, solutions for live productions. And as you can imagine there, um, any failure case is really a big problem uh, because also we're quite often at the very end of the production pipeline. So if we mess up graphics, like put them at a completely wrong place or completely mess up the keying, then that's what the viewer will see at home. So there's no time to correct or, or change that because um, sometimes the delay... Um, from our software until it really goes out and is broadcast is, is less than a second. Um, so it really needs to, needs to work in real time um, without failures. And also the real time uh, requirement um, gives us additional requirements on the performance. So depending on the frame rate, you really have to process the frames in 20 milliseconds or sometimes even less. We also have to support all the different formats for broadcasting, so newer formats like 4K, HDR. So it also needs to work on all these different formats. And what can also be a huge problem sometimes is when they uh, uh, introduce compression because they need to transmit signals from lo one location to the other. Then depending on the, uh, the amount or the the severeness of the compression artifacts, you really also need to take that into account when you program your solutions, because these artifacts, if you don't consider them uh, when designing your models or, or selecting your data for training, they can really mess up, for example, your keying. And additionally, um, sometimes we are really at the very end of the production pipeline, so the signal we get already has external graphics like logos, lower thirds, and so on, so we also need to deal with those. And this depends a bit on the, the country and uh, the customer, but sometimes they can be really picky uh, when it comes to the quality of the expected output, so there's really not too much uh, room for, for mistakes. So how can we still get it to work, or what do we need to do to actually use these solutions that we, that we pick up from, from research? So one thing is and that uh, can be a really annoying thing, is you really need to collect your own data. So you need a huge variety of data, and if you look, for example, at sports, that means you need to capture footage in many different stadiums, many different players with different jerseys, different weather conditions, and then if you multiply that with the number of sports, then it becomes really a huge amount of data that you need, and, of course, you also need uh, the ground truth labels or some kind of labels for your data to use it in your training for the AI. Um, what does help a bit there and what we do heavily is we augment the data. So if you have some ground truth data, um, you can apply transformations that preserve the ground truth. So, for example, you rotate your data, you scale your data, things like that. So basically, this gives you a way to increase the, the size of your data set. And in some cases, um, it's not even possible to capture the data um, the way that you want it. Um, so you really need to also sometimes synthetically generate or simulate some effects um, that can be that you apply that um, modification on your whole data set before training. And finally, in the end, um, to make the model fit um, performance-wise, quality-wise, and so on, uh, usually we have to modify the base architecture that we get um, and also adjust the, the parameters, um, play around with the parameters to make it work. So yeah, that was it a bit um, about the sports. And as Fabrizio mentioned, uh, recently uh, we also started to branch out a bit. So our goal is to uh, become a bit uh, the AI hub um, of our company. So the goal is to develop AI solutions not only for sports, but also for the other products and for the other sites. And one thing that we started recently as a, a proof of concept is the human post tracker. So the problem we solve here is we get the, the input feed from a virtual set, for example. 
which includes the video stream and uh, camera information. So um, you will know where the camera is, um, what zoom it has, uh, rotation angles, and so on. And given that data, we then compute the 3D pose. So in our case, that's the location of the joints in 3D um, of the talent. So here's a short video showing a proof of concept where we have three talents um, that are tracked. The different colors of the joints indicate the ID of the talent. And as you can see, um, there are some problems that, that need to be handled uh, when talents um, move in front of, of each other, also when they enter and leave the screen. So those are all things that we need to handle. So once you have that data, uh, you can do a lot of nice things. So one thing is you can just add graphical effects um, to your virtual studio, like reflections, shadows of the talent, things like that. Or what I think is more interesting, um, you can also think about um, having the presenter interact with your virtual uh, studio scene. So if, for example, the presenter can grab and move um, virtual objects, he can collide with virtual objects, um, the presenter can trigger events and graphics, graphics with hand gestures and movements. So there can be a lot more interaction um, of the talent with your uh, virtual scene. So this is also a, a short video um, where one of our guys just stitched together a small scene and added some reflections for the talent, um, just using the, the information from the post tracker. So, yeah, to summarize again what we do in Zurich, so I think we have a lot of interesting AI projects, um, keying, matting, object detection, and tracking, human pose detection, thank you, uh, and tracking, and we do not just do AI, but also the other areas of uh, computer vision are, are very important um, in our products. So a big part is also camera calibration and rendering, and just image processing in general. And yeah, this brings me to the topic of internships and master thesis. So we're always happy to um, have students that are interested in doing internships and master thesis. So we're always happy to get applications or also if you're just interested and want to know more, talk to us, um, write us an email. Um, Areas of interest include video inpainting and hole filling, image and video generation, null rendering for wide baseline multi camera setups, pose estimation, player model generation, motion synthesis, uh, video analysis, and event spotting. This can also include uh, tracking data that we get from player tracking, um, and also uh, AI based um, camera calibration. And what we can offer um, for you is uh, you can work in our office, so you get your own workspace um, where you can closely collaborate with the people there and also, if needed, get some supervision. Uh, we also have, uh, I would say, a high-end lab with equipment that's used for broadcasting. Um, just recently, we also uh, constructed a small uh, green screen corner uh, where we can experiment with virtual sets and virtual presenters. Um, and finally, uh, we also have a growing uh, data set or growing data sets that you can use for your experiments and uh, for your development. So yeah, if you're interested, come see us, um, talk to us. Uh, you can also just send us an email and we can get things started from there. And um, I would like to also give you a short example um, of what an internship or a master thesis could look like. Um, so, for example, recently um, we had an intern that was working on the design and training of the basketball AI here that you actually saw in the results. And um, he started by intelligently using the existing data we already had from other sports to bootstrap the whole process which allowed him then to uh, develop an algorithm to collect new data for the basketball. And as I said, 
the resulting AI key for basketball that you have seen is actually built um, on his work, so we continued uh, what he started there. He later also did his uh, master thesis with us, um, where he designed and implemented an algorithm to create virtual flights. And what I think was quite nice there was that he could use or reuse functionality that he himself uh, implemented during the internship. So this is one of the results that he produced. Um, on the left, you can see the two input images. So it's just two images from two different cameras. As you can see, the baseline is really huge. So the angle between the cameras is really, really uh, big. And all that you get as an input is really these two images from the camera and the calibration of the camera. And on the right side, you see a comparison. On the left is an old, like classical computer vision baseline method, where you can see heavy ghosting artifacts as we go from one camera to the other. And on the right is the, the result of his thesis, which I think looks uh, visually more pleasing. Um, of course, there's still a long way to go if we uh, want to use it for a big scene with a lot of players, a lot of different teams, different sports. Um, but we have to start somewhere, and I think over for this case, for the baseline, it's a, it's a big improvement. And, yeah, I mean, you can also be sure that for internships, we don't just uh, give you tasks that we don't want to do ourselves. Um, usually it's tasks that we in R&D are interested in, but somehow uh, didn't end up on the roadmap for whatever reason, but we still would like to do it, and then we often um, work together with internships to get these uh, things done. So that was it. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask, and as I said, if you're interested in more, feel free to also contact us uh, via email. Thank you. Do you have any questions right now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was really clear and easy to follow. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you install your own specific camera in these venues or you have to rely on existing ones and where it So that's actually one of our selling points that we don't. Um, require additional cameras, so we really don't touch any hardware um, in the stadium at all. We don't add additional hardware, so we just work with the video streams that we that we get. But do you have information about their parameters and calibration parameters? No, no. So really, uh, we no. just uh, usually we have a, a short time slot before the game where we get a stream from the camera. And we then use that to um, do an image-based uh, camera calibration, uh, where we also pre-process some things that we then can use for the live tracking during the game um, of the camera. I mean, it's, uh, at the beginning, we give some support, so we help them with the setup, we show them how to use it, but it's really the software that we sell. Um, so that usually they also buy the hardware with us, so they just get a bunch of, of PCs for whatever they need with the software. Um, and uh, we also give trainings to the operators. So that's usually how it works. So TV stations, either they have their, their own operators or it's a, like another company that provides this service that just have, um, they have people that do this professionally. So they go to productions and operate the software. Yeah. And uh, um, about the live uh, broadcasting, mm -hmm. No, that's actually used. So, for uh, example, one big customer is, is NBA. Um, if you watched last year's finals, or um, I think also this year, I don't know if they renewed, um, but you will see the graphics on the on the on the ground on the pitch. Um, and also for camp carpets uh, for soccer, it's in use. Um, Tennis productions, rugby productions. So it's it's already used also for live productions. Also the NFL 
uh, yes, big, the uh, first and ten line, line that you saw. Yeah. And, and all, all the stuff that you saw in the videos were already on TV, else we wouldn't be able to show it because we don't have the rights. So yeah. More questions? No. Uh, I think the time is over, anyways. But hmm? yeah. So thank you again. <laughs>